Las Vegas. Uh, there's about a million people living here, and if um, if we if we could grasp what it must be like to, I mean, there was a big story in the in the headlines of uh, of the Wall Street Journal recently about what the children in uh, in in Iraq, for example, uh, what what their life is like. Like, what is it like to be a child in Iraq going to school? And one of the things it's like to be a child at seven or eight or nine years old and going to school is that on your way to school, you might step over seven or eight dead bodies that are just lying in the street. And the, and the trauma of this generation, they said this generation of young people in this country of 25 million people, which was 27 million before we started this hor horrific thing, and two million of the, t of the top, uh, the intelligentsia of that country have just either moved or, or been killed. Um, so what is that like? And it, it, suppose in Las Vegas that uh, every day for the next year um, we, were to, um, we were to find a hundred bodies, just a hundred bodies, either de decapitated or just uh, you know, with their hands behind them and their, and their heads blown off and, and these kinds. If this was something that we were looking at, if we were facing, um, there, would be a different, there would be a different consciousness, wouldn't there, Marianne? There would, there would be a different... There would be a so what we have done is we have gone... We have created a space in our world in which uh, it's okay for us to say that we're at war, and we, we have a lot of talk about being at war and supporting our troops and all of this kind of language is going on. Meanwhile, um, we're also told, you know, to go to Las Vegas and, and, to, and to go to the shows and to, and to not, have, uh, not have on your mind... Um, what is going on over here? In fact, we don't even want to have any photographs taken of the of the caskets that are coming home uh, with the flags draped over them and so on. So that uh, we're we're doing it and and we're also ignoring it at the same time. Well, I think that in today's world there are enough people who hate war, but I think for many of us of our generation, particularly Americans now, the the, the deeper challenge sometimes is getting over our hate of the warmongers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. because, you know, the muscle in my head towards the American defense establishment or, what, or mm -hmm. whatever. I also think, and, and I've talked about this quite a bit <clears throat> and written about it, I'm fascinated. When you, when you talked about May 4th and the, the 1970, the killing of, of the, the um, students at Kent mm -hmm. State, uh, 1968, April 4th was the assassination of Martin Luther King, etc. We were young at the time when <clears throat> Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther, King Jun Martin Luther King Jr. and others were holding aloft in the public domain this notion of a spiritual world that could partially be created uh, and cultivated through politics and social activism. I mean, many of us remember we sang all you need is love at political rallies. And I was, we were stoned at the time, <laughs> but, we, but we're not now, and that's relevant, because right. it's all about are you the container, are you psychologically and emotionally what you need to be to contain the spiritual energies mm. you want to move through you? Mm. Because a lot of us, you, you attract spiritual vibration, but you don't have the, the dignity and the nervous system and the emotional and spiritual, it, it, psychological capacity to hold it, not just receive it, but hold it and then express it. So we were young. And, you know, Bobby Kennedy was not young, and, and Martin Luther King was not young compared to us. We looked to them. And I think that when Kennedy was killed, when uh, Martin Luther King was killed, when those kids at Kent State were killed, it was as though psychically those bullets shot all of us. Mm. And there was a very loud, unspoken message in those assassinations. And that message was that basically we would go home now, there would be no further protest, mm -hmm. we would leave the, we would do whatever we wanted to do in the private sector, expand those markets, mm -hmm. but leave the public sector to whoever obviously wanted it so much they were willing to kill for it. And I think that for the last few decades that's exactly what we did. And then this whole idea of the cycles and the generations is so fascinating to me because the generation that was young at that time, <clears throat> who basically did what we were told, we take, we took the when you think of the talent and the resources and the intelligence and the privilege and the education of this generation, particularly of Americans, it's like nothing the world has ever seen. And we are now dealing, I think many of us, with the, on a level of shame and horror at knowing that basically this generation that 
came with this promise to make the world better, thinking that's what our mission was, have actually now presided over an era which has gotten in many ways worse. We have not yet really fulfilled that destiny, that promise. And now, those of us who are old enough to start thinking about death, and I looked up the Jung quotes after hearing that marvelous quote you mm -hmm. gave, and Jung talks about how if, if after 35, he has some quote about if you're not considering what the implications of death, you're not really growing up. Mm -hmm. It's part of being mature. And I think for many of us who have gotten to that point of thinking about death, we don't like the idea that we might die knowing in our hearts we didn't really go for it. And I think any, any unspoken threat with the assassinations in the 60s that you better be quiet or we might kill you too. Not spoken, mm -hmm. but we felt it. We I sure think, did. I think for many of us now, the thought of dying, feeling in our hearts we didn't really go for it, is actually scarier to us than the thought that they might kill us if we do. Mm. And that's what brings me full circle. I'm just so glad to be talking about this. With yes, you. I am too. on my radio show, The Oprah and Friends, who lives in Baghdad, and she said that when Saddam was in power, they knew who the enemy was, and they lived knowing, well, one day he'll die, mm. but that today, they have no idea who an enemy is, and that today, in ways that was never true when he was in power, everybody kisses their child goodbye when they go to school in the morning and the parents go to work with just a hope and a prayer that they will all survive mm -hmm. uh, to meet later in the day. So obviously it is a horrifying situation. The deeper question for us, of course, is why did we go along with it? Why is the kind of reflection and horror and consideration that is on the table in this for us now, why was this not on the table for us uh, before 9-11, uh, not before 9-11, I did not mean that, before the invasion of Iraq, given that Iraq did not invade us, 9-11, uh, etc. And it was, it, it reminded me of a scene in Gone with the Wind, where everybody was rah, 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 rah about going to the Civil War. And again, when you read things like that with World War I, how did we allow ourselves to so easily be propagandized? And I'm reminded I, you know, when we were talking before about war and, and peace and how we used to see peace as merely the absence of war, it reminds me of what we went through in a transformation of our thinking about medicine. We used to see health as the absence of sickness, but we've mat matured beyond that. We no longer wait till we get sick and then just try to allopathically eradicate and suppress symptoms. We know that peace is a, excuse me, health is a positive state that must be proactively cultivated and maintained. The doctor doesn't just have a you know, silver bullet, but we still, we have matured and evolved. But we, we now need to make, it seems to me, that same transformation in our thinking about politics. Our political problem solving uh, skill set is primarily allopathic. You just wait till violence erupts and then you try to uh, uh, suppress or eradicate the symptom. Mm. And now we are waking to the notion that no peace is a positive state. Peace is more than the absence of violence. Violence is the absence of peace. And peace must be proactively cultivated and maintained. And so I believe, first of all, the only possibility we have for turning this thing around is if we claim the metaphysical power, it will happen. You know, it's like, it's like a parent becomes, you know, certain things are not going to happen in this house. It's just not going to happen. That's so, we have to that's be that so way good. about this planet. It's on its way. It's, it's on, on its way. Its way. It's and on its way. even for those of us who don't live to see it, let's die trying. Yeah. That's what I say. That's great, Marianne. Thank you. Thank you so much.